All right, we're going. All right, we're ready. All right. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Bonjour. Um, oops, have to turn that on. That's important. My name is Matthew Perry. <laughs> Not that one. But uh, this one, yes, that's my messy desk. And no, those are not password stickies. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, I'm the uh, computer guy at the master's law firm. I'm a board member of AID. Uh, I'm a board member of the 304 Geeks. We put on a little conference every year called HackerCon, which you may have heard of. Yeah. Yay, HackerCon. Uh, I'm a board member of an online gaming group called Red Sky. Uh, there's my wife and kids. That's a very, very old picture. And uh, since my son, since a lot of you know me, my son got engaged this week, probably getting married in October. Wow. That's exciting. That Maybe. And won't that be fun? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm also a uh, licensed minister. Uh, so what do I really do? Well, I do litigation support, trial support, network administration, all that stuff, but at the end of the day, I'm really just the old computer guy. Does anybody know what CCP stands for? Do you know? <laughs> it's an old certification called Certified uh, Computer Professional, and that was from back in the uh, 90s. No, they don't do it anymore, but I, I are one. Um, so, our talk today is about how to test your security awareness program. Now, our good friend, Bill, wrote this book, Building a Security Awareness Program, which I'm sure he'd be happy to autograph your copy or uh, there's probably for sale in the lobby. <laughs> um, but anyway, this is kind of the, uh, the opposite. You know, once you, once you have built your security awareness program, then what do you need to do? Well, you need to test it. So Bill and I are hopefully given this uh, presentation as a class at DerbyCon this year, if Adrian accepts this, hint, hint. Um, so this is kind of the outline. This is kind of the outline to uh, the class that we're doing uh, there. So how to test your security awareness program. Well, the first thing about any security program and, and anything that you should be aware of, any place you work, is how the backups work. <coughs> Now the key to a good backup system is KISS. Not that KISS, but this KISS. And um, you know, my backup system at work is uh, is really simple, and I'll show you what, how I do mine. But you know, it doesn't really matter to me whether you have a uh, on or a, you know an in-house uh, hardware device, tape drives, or if you back up to the cloud, uh, or if you do like uh, Dilbert here and. Um, you know, rely on the NSA for your backups. Um, yes, these are the jokes, people. You have to laugh. Uh, so here's some statistics about backups. Uh, prior to an attack, four out of five organizations uh, were confident that they could recover completely from a backup. And this was specifically uh, was talking about a ransomware attack. Uh, but then they went back and polled those people after they had suffered a ransomware attack and only 42% were able to successfully recover from a backup. Now, you know, why is that? Well, mostly because they didn't test their backup. You know, we, we the city of Atlanta issue was in the news, um, was in the news this week, and, you know, they, they were seemingly able to recover, but part of their recovery was so painful that they were still down for weeks. And... It, um, Steve uh, Reagan from CSI just wrote a story, um, CSO online, sorry, just wrote a story about, um, you know, is it a business decision whether you want to restore from your backup or you want to pay the ransom? You know, depending upon how much the ransom is, if you think that it may work, I mean, you know, restoring from your backup, if your system is really complicated, could cost tens of thousands of dollars and, and take weeks. Uh, so it may be cheaper to pay, but you need to have a good backup. Now, I, I'm working on a case right now where um, a uh, RAID drive, uh, two, two drives in a server's RAID <laughs> failed. And, of course, they weren't able to rebuild the RAID because you can't rebuild if two drives fail. And we're, we're suing the uh, 
company that was supposed to be maintaining this business's server because they weren't maintaining the server. And, and you know, it's my opinion, and I think probably the opinion of most of you guys in the room, that two drives in your RAID don't fail at the exact same time. So we think that one of them had been uh, dead for a while and nobody bothered to check. So you need to have good backups. And what complicated uh, matters more in this case was that this, this consulting company had never tested their backup. So when they put the new drives in and went to restore from the backup, the backup was bad too. Yeah. So this is how I do my backups at the office. I'm an old school DOS guy. So uh, I just have these X copies that run on a uh, dedicated uh, 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 timed uh, event on my PC every day, uh, runs at 8 o'clock at night, and uh, then I have some that I run by hand manually. Uh, so every day when I come in, I have a screen that looks like that, and I know about what my workflow is at work, so I know about how many files should be uh, copied, and, and uh, so I check that every day, every single day. And at least once or twice a week, I restore a file from the backup just to make sure that they're all still there. So, test your security awareness. Now, you know, if you set up your security awareness program by right, uh, correctly, it's got a bunch of layers, just like Shrek and onions. Um, so the first thing to uh, testing your security awareness program is start from the outside and look in. So what are your threats? Uh, do you have competitors that would be likely to uh, uh, attack your business or want to steal your trade secrets? Uh, how cutthroat is the industry that you particularly work in? Uh, do you have adversaries? You know, I work in, a, in the legal field, so we it's an adversarial uh, process. So we have uh, law firms and companies that we are directly adverse to uh, that would potentially be interested in, you know, maybe not interested in the stuff that we have, but in keeping us from performing our job. Um, do you, uh, is your business something that would be subject to hacktivism? You know, if you worked at a gun manufacturer or if you worked at uh, YouTube, as we saw this week, you know, you may be subject to uh, some sort of an attack. Um, or is there, you know, is your business uh, have some data that somebody could use for financial gain? You know, there's nothing in my office that uh, anybody would, could make any money off of. But if you have credit cards or any kind of credit card data, then, uh, you know, that makes you a potential target. So there are several companies around now that do this threat intelligence service uh, that they uh, that they offer to people. And uh, there's a nice little article about about those. And uh, you know, there's the binary defense. Uh, Dave Kennedy's company does that. There's another company uh, called Stealth Care that does that. And basically, these threat intelligence services do what uh, Discover Card and their commercial and Experian and their stuff say they, that they'll do for you personally, and that's they monitor the dark web for your secret inform for your personal information. Um, here's a sample of a report. Now, there are, of course, a gajillion of these reports, and they all look different. But, um, you know, this is just an example of one. So, you know, if they're monitoring, you're watching your stuff, one of the things that we do at work is uh, our uh, company that hosts our website and does our social media advertising sells a reputation management service, which is sort of the same thing, except, you know, that's not being hacked uh, as far as your information goes, but it is being hacked as far as your business goes. You know, a bad review or a fake bad review, I should say, can, can, be, can be really adverse uh, to your business, and I think that falls inside of the security personnel's realm to monitor that stuff. So this is a quote I came across while I was uh, uh, preparing for this talk, and, and it, it really kind of hit home to me. And, and if you're going to protect your stuff, uh, you have to know yourself. So, you know, if you, if you don't know yourself, how do you have little chance of doing anything else? So... As we assess our threats, one of the things that I did at work was I built a business intelligence database. And does anybody know what business intelligence is one of these weird terms? Does anybody know what it really is? Bill, what is business intelligence? It's dirt on your 
basically people that you're adverse to. Well, not the dirt, but open source intelligence on who it could either be adverse to your position in a case, in the case of a law firm, or it could be your competitor in the case of a big corporation. It's a great corporate buzzword. It is a great corporate buzzword. And you know, when you're looking it up, it has all these weird definitions like this one. You know, business intelligence is technology-driven processing for analyzing data, presenting actionable information to help executives. You know, I read all that stuff and I was like, I still don't understand what the hell that really means. So I thought, well, cyber business intelligence, right. It's walking around at a conference and stealing all your, not stealing, taking all of your competitors' sales brochures. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> So, you know, I was looking, I was tr still trying to figure this out, so I, I thought maybe I'd find one with a picture that that would help me figure it out. But, uh, you know, I, I, I still don't know that I completely understand the whole business intelligence concept, but I will tell you what I did. So I bought a program called DT Search, which is really cool uh, and really cheap, and uh, I built a big database of our office, uh, and this is, you know, it's not necessarily a security thing, but I, per se. But I think that it is because how do you, how do you know if you've lost something if you don't know everything that you have, right? So you, I built this database of everything that we have, and DT Search is perfect for that. It basically lets you do a Google-like search on your server and all your documents and all your stuff, and then you know if you want to get into the business intelligence part to put more stuff in here, like. Uh, we'll get into this in a minute, but you know, if there's if your industry articles, if there's stories about your business in the newspaper, if there's stories about your competitor on on the internet, and then you save those into there too. So then, when you're looking for stuff um, that had happened, you know, every business has this. Is you, you'll be in some meeting and somebody will say, "Yeah, you know, we did that before back in the such and such case." Uh, you know, what was it? And uh, nobody will remember, but. If you have a tool like this, you can look it up. So, and the next thing in uh, investigating yourself, assessing your threats, is OSINT yourself. Uh, is everybody familiar with this screen, the Google uh, Google Advanced Search screen? So, you know, Google yourself, Google your company, see what's out there that you may not know about. Google your top executives and see what's on the see what's on the internet about them. Because uh, you may not know, and that could become critically important because, trust me, the people that are hacking you are doing exactly that. Uh, now, here's a tip uh, about Google. Is you, see, you see up in the upper uh, right corner of when, you're, when, you have your Google, uh, when you have your Google search engine pulled up, uh, if you're logged in, you get your little picture up there, and it, one of the things nobody ever told me, I had to figure out the hard way, is that really skews your search results. Because if you're logged in, it tries to help you find stuff based on stuff you looked at before, so you end up in this big circular rabbit hole. The other thing, and, and what was important for me, is one of my jobs is to check our web placement for marketing purposes. And if you're logged in, and your login is in any way linked to the website, then yours is always going to come up first. Doesn't matter what the search engine algorithm is. So you're really not getting a good true picture of where you're at. So the tip is I always use another browser that I'm not logged in to my Google account in uh, when, I'm, uh, when I'm doing OSINT work, especially on myself. Uh, now, another thing you can do to OSINT your stuff is a Google Alert. Does anybody here have a Google Alert set up? I know Amanda does on probably something we don't want to know. Um, yeah, I use this all the time. Uh, this is a picture, a screenshot of mine on the Masters Law Firm. And then if you haven't, do, if you haven't done this, do it for your company. So you'll see any time your company's mentioned uh, on anything on the Internet. And it, the lag time... Sometimes the lag time is a whole day, but it's typically about five or six hours. And this is what you get. You get an email. Whatever email you told it to send it to, you get an email with links to the stories. This is the last one we got about our uh, our big class action lawsuit against Equitable. And it was a story in, in, a, magazine, in a trade magazine about the notices going out for, uh, for the lawsuit. So that's good to know. And it's a good thing to keep track of. 
Um, so the next thing to do about assessing your threats is social media use, and do, does your does your firm have a social media use policy? Uh, now you know the the use policy can can encompass uh, you know all kinds of stuff like you know saying your boss is a jerk, firing people for that. But I mean that may seem silly, but you know things like this can happen. So this was uh, Associated Press's Twitter account got hacked. And the Syrian hackers that did it put out this uh, tweet and caused the stock market blip for a day. Now, you know, the, the guy, the computer guy at Associated Press probably had a bad day that day, I would guess. So, you know, you need to have a good social media policy about passwords and restricted access to that. And then there's this poor guy. Anybody know who that is? Yeah. Hmm? This is the this is the poor guy from Hawaii, and I I, I feel really sorry for this guy because you know all of us have clicked the wrong thing at some point in time, but this is the guy who sent out the we're about to get nuked. There's a missile on the way, and Hawaii uh, text message warning to everybody in Hawaii. And you're right, you know, when they and, and this was a this was a picture uh, that <laughs> that was went around the internet, and you can see there's his password. Now I can't read that, but I'm sure somebody can. Um, so, you know, I monitor, and this is going to sound a little draconian, but I do it. I monitor everybody that works for us, Facebook account and Twitter account, because, not because I'm afraid they're going to take a picture of their computer and have a password sticky on it, but because, you know, I live in a, I work in a consumer environment. You know, I work for a law firm. If somebody's posting, my workplace sucks, and you know you're you're cruising our website, and you happen to you know you're googling us, and you happen to see somebody posted where I work sucks. Are you likely to bring your case there? Well, no, you're not. So you know we, I view that as part of my job as a security professional is to maintain. It's not just maintaining the information, but it's maintaining the integrity of the business. Uh, here's some more. Oh, this is just a, about the. Uh, you know, 70% of the people that were surveyed in this uh, survey didn't realize that the First Amendment does not protect you from your boss firing you. You know, the First Amendment is very specific. It protects you from going to jail for saying the president sucks, but it does not protect you from your boss firing you if you say your boss sucks. Um, now, the next step in uh, testing your security awareness program is... Uh, how hard are you to find? And I'm a big believer in security through obscurity. And, you know, one of the things that uh, I do every year in our penetration test we have in the summer is I, I ask the guy doing the penetration test, I said, how, you know, can you find my IP? Do you know where I'm at? And, you know, I, I keep mine pretty hard to find. Um, but there's some, there's some uh, caveats to that. So do you host your own website? Well, if you host your own website, then your IP is pretty easy to find. Uh, but I don't. We keep our we host our website offsite. Now, there may be some industries where you have to, you know, if it's a retail business. But you know, there are things you can do to mitigate that. Um, do you host your own email? Now, you know, a lot of places host their own email and have an exchange server. But you know, that exchange server doesn't have to be on the exact same IP address as the internet access for the rest of your office. Um, but that's another. Uh, issue to look at, and it's another potential way that an attacker could find your IP. Uh, how safe is your internet service provider? You know, if you're relying on Yahoo for your company email, you've got a problem. So, how many entry points are there to your network? How many IPs do you actually have? Uh, you know, how's your connection work? You know, ha have you looked at the physical hardware? Could somebody get into your uh, get into your basement and your wiring closet, and and implant a man in the middle type device? I mean, you need to you need to be aware of all that stuff. Um, how's your Wi-Fi connection at the office? You know, my Wi-Fi is air gapped; it's not connected even to the network. But some places, you know, they have to have Wi-Fi uh, as part of their infrastructure. So you need to make sure that your Wi-Fi is right. Um, you, do you have a VPN? We, we don't have a VPN, uh, but if we ever did, it would definitely have two-factor authentication. It wouldn't just have one. 
uh, so that the person getting in would have to have some sort of physical device as well as knowing their password. How hard is your network? And what I mean by that is, uh, once a payload's delivered, can it get back out? You know, in my last couple of penetration tests, test, we were we were not able to uh, get the payload to execute after uh, it, we intentionally downloaded it onto the network because of the way my network's configured, it couldn't get a port out. And I forget what all we had to do, Bill, to, get, to finally get it to work, but it took a lot of work to eventually get it to, to dial out. Um, and then an important thing that I'm, I'm working on now at my place is what can the attacker pivot to? You know, if, if one machine gets compromised, does that necessarily mean everything else is compromised? You know, if you don't have uh, local administration privileges, then it uh, severely limits uh, what people can get to from, from that one compromised machine. And if you have your network segregated correctly, they may be able to get to part and not all. Uh, now, the next part is, of course, you know, you can test the hardware all you want, but at the end of the day, what it really comes down to is your users. Uh, here's some statistics, and, and Bill will tell you from his Ph.D. level statistics class that uh, there are three kinds of uh, liars in the world. There are uh, liars, damn liars, and statisticians. Uh, so here's some statistics about users. Uh, IBM study says 95% of all successful security attacks are a result of human error. Um, this other uh, uh, magazine did a study, and they uh, they broke theirs down a little bit. But uh, you know, 37% user what they called human error, 25% phishing malware. I still call that human error. External theft of a device, 22%. I still call that human error. And employee theft, 16%. That's still human error to me too. Um, and then here's another one from Chief Executive. 90% of all cyber attacks are caused by human error. Now, interestingly enough, their, their math doesn't add up because at the bottom it says 18% were directly driven by an external threat and extortion counted for 2%. So to me, the first thing about your uh, user environment is we need to create, we as IT people need to create a better culture. And what I mean by that is if the, Users in your office think of you as this guy, you're doing it wrong. Uh, you know, <laughs> if they call the help desk and this is what they get, you're doing it wrong. And if you have this sign on your desk, um, you're doing it wrong. You know, you've got to you got to encourage your users to report things without feeling stupid about it, without feeling threatened about it. Um, you know, they got to be able to speak up about problems. they got to be encouraged to do that. Um, and then, you know, I, this is a screenshot from my place. You know, if, if, if any of my users get a screen like that, you know, they, they, they know they better be calling me. Um, you know, at uh, Bill's last place where he worked, they held a picnic every year, and, and he gave away awards and uh, stuff for security awareness, and um, some were even from Italy. Yes, that's funny. Come on. So the other thing that you can do to assist your users is you can build, uh, you know, some online resources in, in your intranet. You know, you can uh, you can have some FAQs and some data that they can actually access without feeling like that they need to make a call. Uh, and there's some software to help you do that. Uh, and then something else I'm experimenting with uh, that I think is going to work out great is set up a Slack channel for your company. Um, you know, we've, I've got a couple of users that uh, are doing this now, and it works great because, you know, they can all get on there and they can just uh, post questions and text stuff back and forth without having to make a call. And whoever's on the whoever's on the call can whoever's on the channel can answer. It doesn't necessarily have to be you or tech support. Um, so testing and training, you know, training like this is, is cool and nice, and you can get your users in a room and do lectures and stuff, but at the end of the day, you really need to get past that. And, you know, in big organizations, this is hard to do, but I, to me, the best training and, and the best way I get across to my users is going to their office and sitting down with them, asking them what's wrong, 
looking at st looking at their stuff. I mean, I like to go around and touch all my machines every once in a while anyway. Uh, but you need to go around and uh, talk to everybody and do some one-on-one -on -one with everybody. It's just it's just more effective. So, in getting your users uh, up to speed, one of the things that uh, one of the most important things is physical penetration testing. So, when you're going to do a physical penetration test at your office, you know, this is kind of the model that you need to go by. You got to gather your information, you got to decide what your threats are. You got to you got to try and test it and then you got to then if you don't address the problem, there's no there's no point in doing it. So, let me show you this video of uh, how a professional has done it. And um this is a guy named Jason Street, and this is from his. Uh, Let, let's get into this is from his talk in Derby County. How I can do an online compromise. So I needed to do a wire transfer. What do I need? I need five things for a wire transfer. I needed a user ID. I needed a password. I needed their smart card because they do two factor authentication with smart cards because they're secure. They're a bank. People try to rob them. And I need a machine that actually uses that smart card. So I need one of their son local computers. And then I also need uh, network access to their internal network so I could do all that. So with knowing that I need those five things, I told them they needed to give me uh, access to three different branches. I was not aware of any of the branches that I was going to. They drove me to them blind. Well, not blindfold or anything, because that'd be creepy and all that. But it's like they actually just drove me there. Just I, I didn't know anything about it. And I walked in, and let's see what I did. Because you can tell this is their bank surveillance footage. Within the moment of walking into the bank in the upper left-hand corner to being behind the teller line to get ready to install my malware, two minutes and 22 seconds. From walking in for the first time to having full authorization in the bank, two minutes and 22 seconds. I walked in, straight down the hallway like I knew exactly where I was going, which I didn't. That's never stopped me before. Sometimes it's led me to dead ends, which is always, you know, uncomfortable. But, uh, but usually, like this one, it led me to the manager's office. The manager had someone in his office, which was even better. So I just stand out there right outside his office. I stand out there for about 30 seconds. After that 30 seconds has passed, I walk to the very next executive's office. Executive saw me go into the uh, manager's office and talk to the manager, right? Because why wouldn't a person just stand out someone's door and stuff, you know, without talking to him? That's creepy. And so I go into the, uh, the executive's office. I say, hey, I'm with the help desk from uh, headquarters. We're trying to work on the machines. We're trying to work on the GPO policies, make sure the USB rights are properly installed because of the fact that they're uh, having a TCP reset stack problem and stuff, you know, with the flux capacitor. It's not working right. So uh, let, me, uh, let me plug this USB drive in. Don't worry about the rubber ducky on it and uh, test your uh, security. Uh, so that's good. So I, didn't, I plug it in. The command prompt comes up. It's like, oh, that's strange. Let me take my camera out, take a picture of that. There we go, document it. And I went out. I'm now golden because now everybody else in the bank has seen me go to the manager's office and they see me work with the lady uh, executive in her office. I go to the next place, to the next one down the hall, right by the teller office. I told her I'm with, I'm with the uh, desktop support from headquarters. We're working on the machines. We need to look on some stuff. She's like, I need to go look at the teller machines. I need to do the, the assessment stuff, you know, because the TCP reset problems are really called your problems with GPO policies. We need to make sure the USB's not interfering with the magnetic storm, so we got to do that. So, uh, so she goes, and she uh, lets me behind the teller line. And I want you to understand something. This was a high-value target. Not just because of the fact that I was trying to commit, you know, an online, you know, criminal act. It's also because that wonderful gentleman right there who's depositing money, it's like was depositing $250,000 in cash at the time I was doing this. So if I got lazy and just wanted to take the money, I could have done that. But, you know, I never do anything the easy way, right? Look at my life. So it's like I just have to go in and actually start uh, doing the rest of my uh problems with my compromise. So I started plugging in the devices. I started going after the data. And one of the things I did, please know I had plenty of time to do it. I was there for 20 something minutes without getting stopped. The only area I was not allowed to get into, I kid you not, was the bank vault. And I tried. So, oh, I need to go check the bank vault to make sure there's no network jacks and stuff, you know, because we don't want an electromagnetic stuff, you know, coming out through the bank and stuff, you know, or a computer going in and compromising your money. And he's like, well, we don't have any connections to these other banks. Really? 
Are you sure? Maybe I should go look and make sure. No, 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 it's okay. Yeah, but I really want to go look. Come on, let me look. And he's like, no, he wouldn't let me do it, so darn. So, um, and then what we do is, uh, I actually was sitting around in the chair at that point because I'm getting bored now at this point. Please also note one important thing. During this whole compromise, I'm wearing khaki pants, a shirt, a DEF CON leather jacket. <laughs> Thundercat tennis shoes the whole entire time. Seems legit, right? It's like, so yeah, so I did that. See that guy in the snap, snappy sweater vest? I love him. He was awesome. He wanted to help me get the issues. He wanted to help me fix the problems. So he gave me his user ID. He gave me his pass card, uh, his password. But I need a smart card. So, you know, he helped me with that too. That was nice. It's like, uh, so I now have three of the five things that I needed. So I'm sending the computer and a network. The uh, problem with this one was actually the manager. This is one of the things that made me the saddest. Because the manager comes out and he asks what I'm doing. He thinks everybody else verified him. Everybody thinks that he verified me. I tell him what I'm doing with help desk. And he immediately goes and says, oh, have we got a problem with one of the computers. Can you come and look? Luckily, I'm not a plumber. So yes, I go in and I start helping him with the computer. I start looking around and I'm like, you know what? We'll get you a new computer. This is like, this is really bad. It's like, uh, we'll just go get you a new one from the office. His eyes lit up like Christmas. <laughs> and he was like, uh, we got a problem with the scanner. Can you come over and look at the scanner? So I come over and look at the scanner. And I'm like, you know what? Yeah, we can get you a new scanner. This one's like, obviously needs to be repaired. We'll take this one in and take it back. I'll come back in about 30 minutes or something like that and take it from you. And they're like, oh, well, you got a problem with the monitors. And finally, I said, you know what? Guess what? I wasn't supposed to say nothing, okay? But headquarters is actually doing a whole refurb of all the branch offices with new equipment because we're upgrading our whole infrastructure. And you are so freaking cool. I like you. It's like, you know what we're going to do? I'm putting you on the top of the list. You will have all brand new equipment within the next two weeks. And it's like, it'll be all good. He was so happy. <laughs> so horrible because once again I said I do security awareness engagements so I pwned them so hard I actually had to wait till the branch closed so we could get all the employees together to tell them how bad this is by an executive from the company translated in Arabic I speak no French or Arabic it's like in just this accent not usually this war so um, he had to translate to make sure they understood fully exactly how horrible they were pwned and so as he's as I'm talking and the guy's translating, the bank manager holds his hand up like he's in <laughs> And I go, yes. And he's like, um, so we're not the, the computers are, are we, are we still getting the computers? <laughs> and I felt so horrible. I was like, no. <laughs> I'm a bad person. I was lying to you. I felt like I was kicking a puppy. That's funny. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, uh, Jason's a professional. And you may, uh, you may look at that and you may think, well, you know, yeah, he's a professional and, uh, uh, you know, he did all that. And, and, and that, that's cool and funny to listen to. But, you know, would that really happen to you? Well, uh, so I decided we would just have a physical penetration test at my uh, place last year. So we hired this young man. His name's Miles. And many, many of you may know Miles. Uh, so he comes into my office. Now, keep in mind, Jason does this for a living, right? And does very good at it. So, but this, is, this was Miles' first time ever doing this. So he comes into my office, and uh, his pretext is he's, 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 you know, he's a nice-looking young man. He's professionally dressed. Uh, he's got a uh, he's got some kind of a, pa a tablet with him, and uh, he, he walks up to the reception desk and he says, "Hi, my name's Miles. I'm here to work on a copier." Didn't say he was from Xerox, and he said, "You know, can you show me where they are?" So he didn't say where he was from, and he didn't know where the copier was. But the receptionist, you know, he's a nice looking guy. He walks up to her and she goes, "Oh yeah, it's right around the corner." Shows him where it's at. He goes around the corner, then by himself, wanders around the whole first floor of the office, comes up to my office. Me and Bill are sitting in there watching him do this, and chuckling about it. And so my office is divided up into three levels. There's the first floor where the receptionist is, and 
my stuff and all the conference room, and then there's the fourth floor where there's a bunch of lawyers, and the eighth floor where there's a bunch of lawyers. So we tell Miles to go upstairs and, and, and do the same thing. Well, he rides up the elevator before he gets off, walks up to the first desk that he sees, and walks up to that young lady and goes, Hi, my name's Miles. I'm here to work on a company. Can you show me where they are? Sure. Walks him down the hallway, introduces him to people. He's talking to people, looking at stuff, and walks back to the copier and talks to him a little bit, takes a bunch of pictures, and people are telling him stuff. And and the one thing I will say about the lady that took him back there, after he got back there, she kind of, after listening to him for a minute, she kind of realized that he really didn't know what he was talking about. And so she comes back to her desk, and she calls me, and so Miles follows her back down the hallway, and he's, he realizes that she's starting to get on to him, so he just leaves, and he gets on the elevator. But, of course, he doesn't go upstairs. He goes up to the eighth floor. So when he goes up to the eighth floor, uh, it's even a little more secure in that there's a door that's always locked, and you have to knock, if you don't have a key, you have to knock on it to get in. So his instructions were just to knock and wait. And so he does, and sure enough, somebody comes to the door and opens it. He says, hi, I'm Miles, I'm here to work. Can you show me where they're at? Sure, no problem. Walks him all the way down the hallway, and then this floor, though, they're even more accommodating. They're like, oh, you're here to work on the copiers? Well, here, here's something I printed that I'm having trouble with, and he goes in this one lady's office, and he's like, you know, I want to make sure that it can print. Can you let me use your computer for a minute? Oh, sure. You know, no problem. It was a disaster. So, you know, I, I had a I had a bunch of classes, and I told everybody at work that this had happened. And I told them, you know, look, you need to be more careful letting people in, blah, blah, blah. So about a month later, I hired this young lady. What's her first name, Bill? We're going to say Kathy. Is it Aviana? Or Aviana? Aviana, I always mispronounce her name. Yeah, me too. So, anyway, we hire her. Now, her pretext is that, uh, you know, she's going to come into the office and she's going to have a uh, flash drive. And she's going to try and get somebody to let her plug that in. So, she walks up to the reception desk and she says, you know, I, I'm, hi, my name's uh, Adriana. I was coming in today to apply for a job. We were hiring at the time, which you could have found out because we were advertising. Uh, she says, I was, I was applying for a job, and uh, uh, I wanted to drop off my resume, but on the way here, uh, I had it printed off in the car, and I spilled my coffee on it, and, and, and so I don't have one, but I have it on this thumb drive. Could you put it in and print it out for me? And so the receptionist now you know, this was kind of an interesting study on uh, penetration testing as far as women versus men goes because, you know, the first go-around, the receptionist was like, sure, Miles, anything you want. Well, now because this attractive young lady comes up to the desk, she's instantly suspicious. And so what does she do? Well, she calls me, and she asks me to come downstairs, and, and so I go downstairs, and she says, uh, the receptionist repeats her story to me and hands me the thumb drive and says, can you print this off for her? And I said, no. And uh, tell her the tell the receptionist that she's passed the test, and instruct Adriana to go up to the fourth floor. So she takes the thumb drive and goes up to the fourth floor. And this time I tell her to bypass the uh, first uh, cubicle that she comes to and just see how far she can get down the hallway before somebody challenges her. So she gets one door down the hallway, and the secretary that's working there does sees her walking by and goes, "Hey, can I help you?" And she says, "Yes." Repeats the story. And this secretary does the, does the perfect response. She, uh, she gets up and she says, okay, hold on a minute. And she escorts her back out to the little lobby, sets her down, says, I'll be right back, comes back to her desk, calls me, recites the story again, and wants to know if she can help this lady, if she's allowed to do that. And I say, no, you're not, and don't tell her anything else. And so she goes back out to the receptionary and says, no, I'm sorry, my computer guy says I'm not allowed to print things from your flash drive. Um... You'll have to go to Kinko's or something to print it and bring it back. Perfect response. Very polite, very nice, but still didn't allow her to plug in the thumb drive. Well, so Adriana leaves, gets on the elevator, but of course instead of leaving, she goes to the eighth floor. Well, she happens to get on the elevator with this guy. <laughs> this is Roger. He works in my office. He's an attorney. And, you know, he, he you can kind of tell from that picture uh, exactly how he is. So he, uh, he, he gets on the elevator with uh, Adriana, and he looks over, and he goes, how are you doing? And, uh, you know, how's your day? And so she tells him this big, long sob story about, 
oh my goodness, you know, I was coming up here to put in, uh, you know, my resume, and, and, and I had to swerve to miss this cat, and my coffee spilled on my resume, but I have a copy of it on this thumb drive. I just need somebody to help me print it out. And he goes, sure, come on back. So he goes in the eighth floor, takes her through the locked door, and his office is all the way at the end, right? So he walks past 20 other offices, all the way back to his corner office, sets her down in his chair, takes her thumb drive, sticks it in his computer, and then he looks over at her. As, as she hands him the thumb drive, he takes it and he goes, now there's no virus on this or anything, is there? And she goes, oh, no, 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 no. So he sticks it in her computer, prints off her resume, takes it, leaves the thumb drive in his computer takes her to uh, the printer, gives her her stuff, sends her on her way, and, and as he's leaving, he says, now, if you get a job here, please don't tell my computer guy that I did this for you because he'll be really mad. Exact words is he'll throw me out the window. Yeah. So, so Adriana comes down to my office, comes up, tells me the story of what happened, and I said, uh, okay, just be quiet for a minute. So I call Roger on his uh, on the office phone, and I put him on speaker. And I say, hey, Roger. And he goes, hey, Matt, how are you today? And I go, so I'll throw you out the window, huh? And he goes, oh, no. <laughs> and I go, Roger, is the thumb drive still plugged into your computer? And he looks, and he goes, oh, no. <laughs> so even though these two uh, students were amateurs. You know, somebody that's going to break in your office and do this is going to be a professional like Jason. But these two amateurs that had never done this before were able to sit down and access one of my computers with users standing around helping them or able to uh, plug in thumb drives in my network with users helping them do it just by having a convincing lie and looking professional and not being all nervous about it. So, you know, that's one of the things in testing your security awareness program. You've got to do these kind of tests, and you've got to educate your users, especially Roger, about, you know, not doing things like this. And I guarantee you, Roger will never do that again. But this summer, we'll find out. So what would have stopped these two attacks? What... what uh, Safeguards could I have had in place that would have stopped these? Anybody? Throw something out. Well, the first thing is visitor's law. And you have to sign in. You know, people should know, you should be able to tell, especially if you work in a big company where you don't know anybody, you should be able to tell if you pass somebody in the hallway whether they belong there or not. And if they don't belong there, then you should feel uh, confident in asking them what they're doing and asking them if you can help them. You know, and especially in our industry, you know, we're a, in my industry, we're a, 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 we're a service industry. You know, we have customers. We're supposed to be nice to people. We're supposed to attract customers. So, you know, you can't be throwing people out of the office. But I thought Pam's response to Adriana was perfect. You know, she got her. She ushered her out to the reception area. She set her down. She was very polite. She was nice. She came back and called me. No problem. So we instituted a nice visitor's log. We don't have badges yet, but we're going to do something like that. Uh, the next thing is locks. You know, Bill and I recommended to my boss that we keep the elevators locked off all the time. Uh, you know, after hours, you have to have uh, you have to have one of these to get into my office. So, you know, our my suggestion was that uh, you should have to have one of these to get in all the time. Um, we're still working on that, but you know, a better locking system would have prevented something like this. Uh, a security camera system would have gone a long way if we had somebody. Now, you know, of course, the drawback to security camera systems is you have to have somebody watching them. If there's nobody watching them, then, you know, it's just a recording thing so you can see what did happen, not what is going to happen. Um, then the other thing is a uh, lock screen, you know, and something that uh, I've been drilling into my users is, you know, you walk, I walk around the office and if I see somebody's not at their desk and uh, the computer's not locked, I'll leave them a little love note. And tell them, you know, hey, you know, I came by and your computer wasn't locked, so, you know, don't do that. Thanks. Uh, that's an important thing that you can do. Turn off USB auto run. You know, if somebody gets in my place at night and they're just able to plug stuff in and, uh, and it automatically do stuff, that's a problem. The other thing is, you know, occasionally 
you get a USB from somebody that's already infected. You know, we got a USB from another law firm uh, that had a virus on it. They didn't know that it had a virus on it. They didn't know that they were infected, but they were sure passing it around. Um, so the next thing with your users is uh, is vishing. Now, vishing is just uh, the same same thing as phishing, except with uh, phone calls instead of uh, instead of uh, physical or um, or email. So you know, with the vishing test, uh, you know you do the same kind of thing. You uh, outline your scope, you develop your pretext, and you do an assessment and education and retest. Uh, so here's a, an example of a professional. Pseudo professional, I guess, Adrian would say, uh, doing a vishing test. P and his team show us how it's done. Step one spoof his number so it looks like he's calling from inside the company and then call tech support. Hello, you there? Hello? Hi, this is Ken. How am I help you? I was wondering if uh, you can uh, take a look at a website I'm trying to get to. It's for a uh, big customer thing I'm working on for Monday, and uh, I can't seem to get to the website from my computer. Sure, uh, what's the website? I'll see if I can get to it. Thanks, man. I really appreciate the help. I mean, it could be a stupid thing. I'm, I'm, I'm really stuck with computers, but uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's www. Survey. That's s u r v e y dash pro. Yeah, I got a prompt to open. I just clicked open, and I'm at the site now. Here's what the IT guy doesn't realize: by clicking that link, he's just given David full access to his computer. Whoa. Okay, that's weird. I just hit it, and it works. It seems like it's working fine now. Awesome. I don't know what you did, man, but I really appreciate the help. Hey, no problem. That was easy. That was it? We're on his computer right now. You were able to take take over this this guy's computer within, I would say, like, under two minutes. Under two minutes, yeah. Under two minutes, took over his entire computer. And, and think of it as not just his computer, but it's pretty much a downfall of the entire company. So there's Dave on CNN, um, you know, basically poning some guy tech support. In some company that he was paid to test, uh, you know, and we haven't—I haven't done a vishing uh, program at my office yet. But you know, I, we don't—I don't have—we don't have a help desk. So, uh, but that's something we're going to look at, look at doing going into the summer. But what would have prevented that? And I don't have any slides on this because I haven't done it, so I don't, I'm not 100 percent sure. But what would have prevented that? Hmm. Education. Education. That's really it. I mean, you know, they look like it was an inside call. So uh, we're going we're gonna to delve into that this summer at my place. So uh, the next user education testing area is phishing. So here again, the same type of program, you know, outline your scope, uh, launch your phishing program, analyze, develop, educate, uh, wash, rinse, and repeat. So here's a video of uh, same Dave uh, in a much earlier life. Well, it's actually interesting. Interestingly enough, it's both Daves because it's Dave at uh, DefCon and in the presentation that he's given, it's Skinny Dave. But in the video that he's showing, it's Big Dave. <laughs> Schmidt is here. She has two teenage daughters. She lives in Connecticut. And Stephanie, I understand that you believe your computer is unhackable. Why? Well, uh, I'm, it's something that's really on my mind. I'm very concerned about it. I, I feel like all of my antivirus software is up to date. I've taken a lot of precautions. I have a computer consultant who comes into my home. So, wait, first of all, does anybody you know in your family have a computer consultant that comes in their house to like make sure that they're, you have a couple? Wow, that's amazing because I never heard of one. So, like, Katie picks the only person in the world that has a computer consultant that's going to lock her computer down. So I'm like, all right, well, do I got to start whipping out some zero days or something like that for this one? But we'll see. To check on these things, and so I really feel strongly that that we have done everything that possible to try and protect my myself and my daughters. I mean, it's something that's really yeah. worrisome for me. Well, that that's very impressive because you seem like you're extremely ahead of the curve. So we decided to put David to the test to see if your comfort level with your security is actually warranted. Tell us what happened. How did you do when we gave you the challenge of... So right there, you know. <laughs> so, so, you know, Stephanie, I would say, was actually one of the, the top 5% of what I would say is being most secure. Um, you know, everything up to date, really locked down, all of those good things. And um, so I literally had plugged in, opened my computer up, and less than 10 minutes or so had a fully designed uh, website that looked real in every way and shape or form of a website that you would visit every single day. 
and I sent an email out, and uh, as soon as I sent the email out, it looks very believable in every way. Uh, she clicked a link, um, and then from there, again, less than 10 minutes of setup time and hacking and all that stuff, I had full access uh, to her computer, uh, her webcam, got around all of her antivirus, everything completely. You are kidding me. Wow. So, you know, as a hacker at this point in time, I'm like, I'm still doing the, you know, I got everything, right? You know? And then I don't even think about what I'm doing. I'm just like, hey, man, I just own everything we you have here, you know? So, tell us oh my gosh. that you were able to see. Well, the first thing we did is we, we enabled her. Why not enable her webcam? It's buying her house. Uh, we enabled her webcam, and we were actually able to monitor everything that was going on in her house, everything from her daughter uh, working on her computer uh, to Stephanie actually walking through the house itself. Uh, we actually enabled the audio as well, so we can actually so enable our audio and turn it into a tap device as well, too, so we can listen to conversations. You know, it's, it sounds all good. They hear everything that was going on at the same time, uh, so we can listen to conversations. Um, from there, you know, we started looking at um, a lot of... I won't let it keep going, it gets worse, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> to say the least, you know, that was one of those moments where, like, you know, you realize, like, how impactful you are as an attacker and, like, the, the you know, effect it can have on an individual. And, you know, the thing is, you know, for me to attack Stephanie, it took about 10 minutes of time. Um, you know, literally, I went on her website, I checked, uh, you know, her Facebook profile, her Twitter profile, saw that she, uh, at one point in time, like a year and a half ago, made a mention about an Amazon package delivery. So I just, you know, cloned Amazon's website, you know, I made a quick, uh, you know, um, uh, package distribution page, and I, I sent her an email saying, hey, you know, Stephanie, just so you know, your package re was rerouted due to a, uh, you know, inclement weather changes or whatever. Please click here when you can schedule a new delivery. And as soon as she clicked the link, it compromised her computer, right? So it took about 10 minutes to set all that up and hack her, her stuff. And it's something that is, you know, may seem stupid, but it works really well because I know that she shops at Amazon, right? So whenever you can establish some sort of trust with somebody, you have the ability to attack them in some way that is very personal that they expect. So, I mean, the after part of that is really, the first part's funny, but the after part is really more important to what I'm talking about, and that's that, what did Dave do? Well, he OSINT at her, he nosed around on her Facebook, he figured out something that she did, and then he designed a spoof in order for her to click on it so that it would, it would uh, hack her computer. Now, you know, this was a lady's personal computer, but at the end of the day, is her security really any different than what your security is at the office? I mean, she said she had her virus up to date. She said she had a firewall. She said she had somebody come and check it all. But, you know, he was able to bypass it all, um, not by breaking her software or all the stuff that she had installed. He was able to bypass it by her letting him do it. So what would have stopped that attack? Well, what would have stopped that attack is, is in my office, is education. So what did I do? We did a phishing attack last year at my office, and this is, uh, of course, the first thing that would have stopped this attack is this. You know, just don't click stuff. Um, oh, Boris. But this is the email that I sent out, out in, uh, in my office, and there are seven things on this email that should have tipped my users off not to click on it, okay? And the first thing is it says proposed order, when down in the bottom it says letter, uh, the second thing is my boss's name is Marvin Masters, but that is not our domain name. Our domain name is uh, themasterslawfirm.com, not masterslawfirms.com. Uh, the next thing is everybody's email said that, even though it went to Rick at the, or Roger, you saw Roger's picture earlier, even though it went to Roger at themasterslawfirm.com, his still said reply, so that was a tip. Uh, the next thing is, of course, there's spelling errors and inconsistencies in the, um, in the text. And then everybody in our office knows we have a big disclaimer signature at the bottom, you know, as all lawyers do. <coughs> if you got this uh, email in error, please throw it away and don't pay any attention to it because we screwed up. Uh, and then the last thing is, look at that attachment. It's a DOCM. Does anybody know what a DOCM is? It is a Word document with macros enabled. Now, why is that bad? Well, I can tell you why that's bad. Three Christmases ago, uh, one of my secretaries opened a supposed resume that well, was a DOCM and caused a ransomware attack in my system and encrypted about two gigabytes of data. So this is what the letter actually said if they opened it. Now, I have 30 people in my office. Um, and the statistics were 17 people didn't do anything. Uh, three people opened it, and ten people called me. 
So the 17 people that didn't do anything are actually a little bit more worrying than the three people who opened it because I don't know what they did. Did they just delete it? Did they just ignore it? Did they not pretend? You know, I don't know what they did. But this is what the email did. Now, this is what it did in the back end. And we had a hard time, because of the way my network is set up, finding some tracking software that would uh, help us. Because, you know, it doesn't do any good if you send this blast out to everybody and you can't tell who opened it and who didn't. So this is what the macro does. It's, a, it's an auto-open macro on Word. So as soon as they open the Word document, this macro executes. And since I'm testing my own network, I already have access to the server. So, And like I said before, I'm an old-school DOS guy. So it just shells out and executes a batch file on the F drive in my folder. And this is what the batch file does. It runs an IP config and pipes the results. Well, there's an old DOS term pipes the results to a text file on the F drive called network settings and this is what the results of that is so that after I did this test all I had to do was look at this text file and I could see the IP address of everybody who opened the Word document. Now another thing about uh, testing your users is snail mail. Now you may not think that that may fall under your your IT concern but but to me it really does because you're protecting the integrity of your business this is an invoice that we got. Looks legit, and it's for toner and stuff. And if we hadn't been paying attention, we may would have paid this. Uh, but you know, we set up a, uh, a double blind system in our office where two, two or three people have to look at uh, all the invoices before they're approved. And you know, this one was so egregious, I actually called a reporter friend of mine, and, and they had to do this story about it in the paper. But uh, you know, these, this company was just spamming out invoices to uh, anybody. And everybody hoping that people would just send them a check and not think about it. Um, the next uh, part of your security awareness thing is your password policy. You know, we all have uh, password stickies stuck around everywhere. And if you don't know, this is Bill's password. Um, that's not a password. That's my luggage. That's your luggage password. But, you know, your, uh, your, your company needs to have a strict and stringent password uh, policy, and you need to enforce it. Uh, and have changes frequently. And one of the things that we do, we have I have multiple software systems that all require uh, passwords to log into, and my users hate this, but I make them use different passwords for each one. Um, and then, uh, you know, this seems silly to us, but, you know, you got to remind your users about this. Don't set your browser to remember your passwords. A uh, similar theme for your passwords is okay, but they still can't be all the same. And now there's some controversy about this one, but uh, this is something that, that uh, Bill and I agree on. You know, if you want to write your passwords down, okay, but of course don't stick them on your monitor. Keep them in your wallet. And then the thing that I would recommend is don't write down what they're for. You know, if you just have like two or three passwords, two or three random strings of letters and numbers written down on a sticky in your wallet, and you don't have what they're for, you know what they're for, but somebody steals your wallet, they don't know what they're for. And, uh, you know, you keep your wallet secure anyway because that's where your credit card is. That's where your driver's license is. So, you know, some people may disagree with that, but I don't, I don't necessarily have any heartburn with that. Uh, the next thing that your users need to have, uh, you need to have a policy about with your, is your user's devices. Number one, don't lose it. Number two, don't connect your personal stuff to your network. Don't do personal stuff on your work devices. And remember that the company is responsible for how you use your work devices. You know, this is this in the legal industry. This is uh, this is obviously something we deal with all the time. And you may not think about it, but you know, if one of your users goes out and does something illegal on their work laptop, and you ended up getting sued over it, we're not just going to sue the user. We're going to sue the company too. And it's the exact same thing as you know, if a salesman. A traveling salesman is out driving around in his company's car and runs over somebody, uh, we sue the company as well as the person. So the same thing applies to devices. And uh, that's it. I've managed to suck away an hour of your life. Anybody have any questions, comments, queries? If not, thank you. I'd like to Her name is not Adriana, it's what, John? Area. 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 Area.